Welcome to the Acrylic Portrait Painting Challenge Masterclass, lesson number five, building up color, contrast, and depth. Hey, I hope you're doing well, and it's been exciting to see all the progress our students have made in this portrait of our fellow student, Diane. And in our last lesson, we ended up uh, putting on a couple of layers just to set up the initial value structure and a little bit of the color temperature of certain areas. Um, if you're taking this portrait challenge, I wanna commend you. I wanna say thank you so much. And I want to give you a high five just for the excellent work you put in. Um, and I wanna let you know too, if you haven't taken the challenge yet, today's a day where you can learn how to paint a portrait you can be proud of. I have all the previous lessons available in this playlist here on YouTube. And so you can definitely go back and get caught up it's not too late and so go ahead and sign up for the challenge right now at realisticacrylic.com forward slash acrylic dash portrait dash painting dash challenge now when you sign up i'm going to send you the welcome kit and that's going to include everything you need to paint along with us uh, that'll include the reference photo with and without the grid the supplies list the palette layout guide and the masterclass lesson schedule. Um, so go ahead and get signed up. It's free to join and you'll get everything you need. You can paint with me and many other students and uh, have a sense of accountability. That's one of the biggest things that artists really can benefit from is having other artists cheering them on and giving them tips on how to improve if they feel stuck. Keep in mind in this challenge, I actually have opened up a live critique we do that once a week so if you're watching this after the fact it wouldn't be available but if you're watching it during the actual challenge time of the month of june in 2023 we have a weekly live critique so be sure to sign up for the challenge you can get notified when we have the next critique and how to join you can enter your portrait in and literally have uh, several people looking at it and giving you tips encouraging tips on what's looking good, on what needs improvement, how to make those changes, while I'm annotating everything on the screen so you know precisely uh, what is needing change and what is working for you in it. So um, go ahead and again, sign up for the challenge and take part in the critiques as well with that accountability and encouragement to move you forward in your goal of portrait painting. All right. One thing I would like to do before we dive into the lesson is just say, hey, do you have any questions? Any questions at all? Go ahead, leave it in the comment below. I'd like to ask you a question as well. Um, how are you doing with the portrait challenge? If you're currently taking it, uh, how are things going? I'd love to know. Uh, are the lessons clear? Are they making sense? Are you uh, feeling like you're progressing, that things are clicking, uh, You know, your portrait's working out? Any aha moments where you know, this new glazing technique is kind of opening up a, a door for you. And, uh, you know, you're seeing some possibilities of how you can use it in the future in your painting. Go ahead and leave me a comment below. I'd love to hear it. Um, now, at this point here, I do want to open up with a word of prayer because everything I do, I do for his glory and I need his help uh, so I can teach you the best I possibly can. So let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Father, I come before you in Jesus name and I just want to Thank you for the students watching this, and I pray that you would bless the rest of the lessons in this challenge. Uh, Father, I pray that you would anoint my hands as I hold the brush, help me to teach everything clearly. Um, I pray that the students would be able to understand uh, what is possible with the glazing technique and how they can use it to um, become a better portrait painter. So help me to teach that Lord, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's dive in here with this first step of this lesson. And the very first step here, based on where we ended up last time, is to just continue building the contrast on these specific areas. So that's exactly where we ended up. Uh, we put down a layer of ultramarine blue and raw sienna uh, mixed with a lot of matte medium. And with the glazing technique, everything is very, very light. All right, so I just want you to kind of think about that as we do the process. I can paint 
very, very light. And we'll just start light, just like a Polaroid camera, and then build up, build up, just like, you know, when you start driving a car and you're uh, moving from that stop sign, you don't go right from zero to 60, unless maybe you have a Corvette, but you have to, you know, switch gears and you build up momentum as you go along. It's kind of the same thing with this. Um, you, you start out very, very light, and as you establish more and more contrast, more color, you get more confident with it, then you can get a little bit bolder uh, with those paint applications. Um, so again, we just used a few colors. Really, we just used, uh, I believe, ultramarine blue and raw sienna and matte medium. That was it uh, for the entire lesson, for lesson four. Now we're going to add a little more complexity. We'll use some different colors. And uh, we're going to also start um, putting in some smaller value shapes. So uh, with this portrait, you want to recognize that all we're doing is we're taking what's in reality, reducing it down to simple abstract forms in our mind, and then we're kind of putting it all together again on the canvas. And if you can kind of get past what you're looking at, oh man, I have to paint hair, how do I paint hair? Just reduce it down to simple shapes in your mind um, and I'll help you to do that. And then, you know, anything, doesn't matter what it is, eyes, nose, mouth, hands, um, clothing, uh, whatever it is can be reduced down in your mind to more simple shapes. And then with that, we can add some complexity as we finish up with the texture and detail. But that's coming down the line. For right now, step number one is to darken the small area shadows and values. We want to darken the small area shadows and values. So what exactly is that? Let's let's take a look here, and I'm going to pull up the uh, the reference image, and you'll be able to see it here, especially if I zoom in. Uh, these small area shadows, for example, like um, on Diane's clothing, would basically comprise just like these shapes right here. If you can see this. Um, and we'll just uh, maybe zoom that in just a bit so you really can see what's going on. But like right here, for example, this is a shape. You know, this shadow here, I reduced that down to a triangular shape. And if you follow the way I showed you to sketch it, <clears throat> excuse me, you would have sketched that in as well. This is also a shape right here. So we're seeing that this dark area occupies a specific um, location. I, I use the metaphor of nations and states. You know, if we were to look at uh, this outline here of Diane's form as all of a uh, nation, within that nation we have states or provinces and they're smaller shapes within that shape. And then you can get even more complex and you can have counties within the states and then you have even smaller shapes. So again, we're just trying to break it down and see uh, where these specific forms are at. An easier one to see, of course, would be uh, the shadow here being cast from the paint brushes. Um, be that as it may, that's what we're trying to do here is uh, just put in those simple value shapes. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, for that purpose, let's take a kind of a half inch. Yeah, we'll take a half inch flat here. I think that's going to give us the best mobility. So that looks like this, half inch flat. And this actually is maybe a little less than a half, but a half inch or smaller will be fine. Half inch, half inch or three eighths. And we'll take some raw umber dark. And just kind of set that off to the side. And we're gonna mix that with some ultramarine blue. Raw umber dark, ultramarine blue, about 50-50 mix. And then again, controlling your mixture here with the glazing technique. Um, I kind of introduced that technique in lesson four. So if you missed that, you'll want to go back to it and double check. But the concept again is mixing a little bit of paint with a lot of matte medium. And we're stirring this together, creating kind of a neutral gray color. Now I'll show that to you. Um, on our white card and this is what that looks like right there so it just basically creates a gray that blue and that brown mixed together 
Um, this is going to be a little more opaque than our first mix because we are darkening in the shadows. Again, uh, these small value shapes and shadows. So let's go ahead and do that. And we'll want to, I think, start right here within you know, the arm area and kind of work out from there. All right, so we use a lot of short choppy strokes and just kind of um, spread it around in that way. We're using the chisel edge of the brush. Okay, there's an angled edge and we use that chisel edge to get in these wrinkles. Now at the edge of the glaze, I'd like you to take your finger and just kind of dab the edge this is acrylic, so it is um, relatively non-toxic. I mean, it is supposed to be completely non-toxic, but I wouldn't recommend um, eating without washing your hands after doing this. Anyway, if you dab the edge of it, you can kind of smooth out that glaze so it doesn't have a super harsh edge because we're trying to you know, create a, a sense of shading and nuance, but we have to start somewhere, and we just start with that one shadow. Um, now, from here, we'll go ahead and we'll add a glaze uh, to the paint brushes. We'll add a glaze to the paint brushes and just darkening those forms a little bit. Now, we want to see kind of the pleating on her dress or shirt here and render that. So I'm just putting in this color right there. Now you might wonder, you know, hey, Matt, the, the color of her shirt is kind of green. Why aren't you using green? Well, the reason I'm not using green is because when values get darker, they get less saturated. That means the color gets less vivid. Um, and so because of that, we want to use something cooler in tone like this ultramarine blue and raw umber dark. Now we go ahead, fill in this whole shadow right here on the right hand side. We use this brush and spread it around. Now notice the brushwork, how we're just kind of quickly smoothing that out and lifting away until we get something that's relatively smooth. doesn't have to be perfect. If it does get a little blotchy, don't worry because uh, eventually this is going to get quite dark. And so it'll be just fine to have a little bit of streakiness in it. Now, let's go ahead and, and move on to that right hand side. Just going to move that camera over a little bit. And here we're going to darken the arm on the right hand side. Now I'm reloading my brush regularly, so you want to be reloading it when you run out of paint. You should have a nice mixture here. And again, keep in mind I have that whole area of matte medium that's got no uh, paint mixed in. But we're going to go ahead and just continue on cutting around the hand. Try not to paint over that because that is a really light form. Cutting around the brush. So the way to do that is use some firm pressure, use an angle that mirrors the, um, the palette, I mean. Cutting around that palette, use a firm edge to kind of slice along the edge of that palette and then radiate away with perpendicular brush strokes. That is the way to do that. And then we just kind of work our way up work our way up again using these short brush strokes then we lift up with using very very light pressure and just kind of radiate away and that's how we get that kind of smooth sfumato brush work brush pressure is a very um I don't know, it's not, it's not a technique that's thought of very much, but brush pressure is very important in this whole process of glazing. <clears throat> so I'm endeavoring to show you that. Let's make sure I get that glaze all the way up to the edge of the arm. So I'm using the chisel edge 
kind of slicing downward and then horizontal uh, slight little strokes to kind of smooth that out. Okay, so now let's do some shadows up in the hair. And we'll do that. Um, so for this, I think I better add just a little bit of raw umber dark. So I'm going to add just a little bit of raw umber dark here and kind of warm it up, um, making it more brownish because that's going to blend better with her hair. Now, I'll show you that quickly here um, on the white card so you can kind of get a look at that and the difference between that and the other color. I'm going to try to show you some key mixes on the white card, although I, I won't be able to show you everything, but I just want you to be cognizant of what these look like apart from the canvas. And still, we're quite translucent here. I would say maybe 10% uh, paint or 15% paint and 90, 85% matte medium, something like that. But let's go ahead and we'll move on up here and start getting some glazes to block in the hair. I better start from the left hand side just to make sure yeah just to make sure that uh, I don't smear anything. Now I'm only going to do the darkest values so you really want to just hit some of these areas using the chisel edge of the brush. If you have too much paint on your brush you can go ahead and squeeze it off on your palette just like this. All right, and then you can go back up there and, oops, wrong camera, there we go. Just got a new camera actually, so I'm getting used to that. I added a fourth camera to my setup here, um, just so I can really switch back and forth in between everything and show you all the detail without having to move the camera so much. Okay, so we're bringing this up here. We'll get a little bit of shading up on top I have to be careful because there is a reddish color in there and I don't want this cooler color to cancel it out. So again, I'm just bringing this into the darkest values and the values that are a little bit cooler in tone. So that's important, just to really make that distinction. Okay, we'll get some more paint on the brush. So keep in mind where the values are very dark, you can get away with using a color that is less saturated. When I mean less saturated, I'm saying on a scale of the color being mixed with gray, it's mixed with more gray. So imagine any color you can, whether it would be the blue of my shirt or it might be the red of this mug here. Oh boy, I gotta, I gotta take that back in the house. My, my wife has been looking for this. I might be in trouble by putting this on video, but <laughs> she's like, Matt, bring back all of my coffee mugs. Um, anyway, but let's just imagine, imagine the blue of my shirt, the red of that mug, and then you would mix that color um, with gray and in varying amounts. And that is saturation. I might do a separate video on that. Um, just to really teach that concept. But uh, you have a color that's desaturated. It has less of its own color and more gray mixed in. And we don't literally mix gray into it. We do it by using like a cooler tone that's complementary often. Um, but all that to say that you can get away with using less saturated or, or more desaturated colors that are less vivid in these areas where the values are darker because they're more natural that way. You know, like if you um, have a color, you know, in your bedroom, let's say you've got some clothing or curtains that are quite vibrant, but if you turn the lights down, if, the, if it's, you know, later in the day, you're not gonna see those colors in their true uh, tint, their true temperature. They're gonna look cooler because it's darker. So when values are darker they they need to get less vivid and that's what we're doing here with this so I'm just identifying these darkest values I don't want to put this everywhere because if I do I'm gonna end up not getting the right colors in the lighter areas there's some areas of our hair that have really nice 
golden, almost reddish tint to them, a nice goldish brown. And I don't want to put this color there, so I'm not putting it on the outside. Just looking for those darkest values on the inside where there's some natural shadows and we're putting it there. Now we've got a little shadow in here on her hair. I'm really looking at my reference photo back and forth. I don't know if you can see me here, but I'm just always, always looking at that reference photo just to make sure I'm painting what I see and not what I think I see. Because that's often when things go a little bit uh, wonky on her paintings. It's when we start just uh, freewheeling it and we just just paint and paint and paint and paint, but we're not looking at that reference photo. A reference photo is your guide as you're painting. It's your best friend, <laughs> other than Jesus. Um, but anyway, <laughs> you, you, got, you got to make sure you're looking at that reference photo and uh, really just observing those details. Now, I'm going to add a little bit of shading right on the interior here. Um, there we go right by the neck. Okay, just like that. And see, that's a darker spot too, so I can get away with having that um, a little bit darker, right in the interior here. Uh, in fact, let's just zoom in a little bit so you really can see kind of the brushwork that's going on. Well, we're just kind of dabbing that in, and cutting along the edge now. Well, we need to use some different colors on the interior. But uh, if you have a nice brush, it's in good shape and it's got a good chiseled edge, you can use that just to get those little areas in the corners of the mouth. Those are some dark values that do need to be done, uh, do need to be described in the form. But uh, you might also want to switch to a different brush, like a small round brush for that. Before we do that though, let's make sure we get this shadow under the thumb hole for the palette. That's important. That doesn't actually go all the way to the edge. There is a little area that's light right in the lower corner, so you don't want to uh, miss that. It's just right there, so I didn't paint on that corner there, just kind of coming up to that point. I had a little bit of a shadow under the finger here, very lightly. I do sometimes dab it with my finger if the glaze looks a little too thick or too dark. Um, Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and just get that, just get those little details on the eyes using this same glaze that we've been using, and that would be this kind of raw umber dark ultramarine blue glaze. So we'll go ahead and we'll um, kind of darken the eye, eyelid, eyelash area, the little area around the irises. And this is how you really be able, you, you begin to establish some realistic looking eyes. We're already setting up the foundation right now. And that is by actually darkening just the edges. Now, if you darken just the edges and uh, kind of pay attention to what's going on in your reference photo, like I'm literally putting the glaze um, only up to this point. I don't know if you can see that, and I'm leaving this open here. And then later on, I'll come in with a more robust kind of brownish golden color and fill that in. And that's gonna give the irises and pupil some separation. And that's going to really make them look realistic. It'll give them that jewel-like effect where you've got the reflection on the left side darker on, on that same side, and then on the opposite side of that reflection, that highlight, you've got more of the richness of the color of the eye. Now I put in a little bit of glaze right here, just to establish the shape of the eye above, getting in um, some of that separation between the eyelid and the lower area. This color will not work for the eyebrows. The eyebrows have more of a warmish tint, so we have to leave that be. Um, but I just want to already begin to establish some of this contrast here. All right. So 
Now, as you can see, we're trying to work everything simultaneously. I'm not wanting any part of the portrait to feel left out or neglected. And again, it's that metaphor of a Polaroid photograph. We fade that in from white all the way into a finished image one step at a time. Uh, so that is, uh, that's what we're doing here. And let's go ahead and with this, I think we're at step number two. So step number two is where we're going to uh, darken the larger area of contrast again. Um, so that would be in this, well, in this particular painting, it would be her clothing. We want to, since we did the small uh, value shapes, we want to then go over the larger shape. And we're always kind of cycling back between these small value shapes and these large value shapes. And with that, we're also thinking in terms of color. So we're always trying to incrementally push uh, towards the desired color uh, that we're aiming for by observing the reference photo one step at a time, one glaze at a time. So let's go ahead and do that color again. Um, in this case here, I think I'm going to add just a little bit more of a vibrant green to it, just ever so slightly. And let's go ahead for this and take our uh, one inch flat. Now we've got some matte medium here set off to the side. Um, I'm going to take ultramarine blue, which we've already used. And last lesson, we used raw sienna, which is a very earthy kind of yellow. It's not technically a yellow, but I, I consider it a form of yellow. Um, but in this case, let's take some Indian yellow, which is a more transparent pigment, excuse me, a more transparent pigment, if I can say that, and much more vibrant, much more intense of a color. And now when we mix that in with ultramarine blue, we're going to get a more vibrant green. And I would like to just have one glaze um, on the surface that has that. Now again, this is a whole different way of painting and sooner or later, you're going to realize that uh, you have a cumulative effect of many glazes working together. So, uh, you know, you don't have just one shot at this. When I put this glaze down that's more vibrant and we look at the color on the palette and we say, wow, that is really intense. That's, that's not the color that I'm seeing on her shirt, but when you mix it in optically uh, with these other colors, then it ends up actually looking really nice. So here is what the color looks like by itself on the white canvas. So if you see that, um, but we're going to, um, we're going to go ahead and just add that on top there and see what happens. Now, if it's a little too intense, we can always tone it down. I'm just going to kind of remix this color a little bit more on my palette just get it mixed better. It was a little blotchy, the application. All right, got that mixed a little bit better. So here you can see it. Now it's uh, yeah, just a little bit more toned down. And then we're gonna go ahead and add that on top and it'll just be this one shot here to um, add this color in. This will probably be the only occurrence of this color then everything else after that will be kind of switching back to that uh, other, other mix we had in the first lesson of ultramarine blue and raw sienna. We might actually add a couple other tones as well. Okay, I'm just going to get a little bit more of this on my palette. All right. All right, we'll just continue on here. Let's zoom out so you can see that. There we go. Okay, now let's cut up along the edge of that palette. And again, we just wanna really get this nice and smooth. So now I'm using some firm brush pressure all the way across, radiating it from left to right. And I only have to just get the one area at a time. So I have a good stopping point right here. And I don't have to, you know, 
do the whole thing at once. Okay, I did some brush strokes going in the other direction really quick just because I noticed there's an area that was a little blotchy. Then I painted over her hand, but I just wiped it off with my finger. It's just the fastest way to do it. All right, and I don't want to overbrush it. Um, we will now do in the bottom part. Let's go ahead and just see what that looks like. I always want to look at the reference photo and not take anything for granted, even though I know that this is the color, just to be on the safe side, it's always good to be in the habit of checking that reference photo. Now you're gonna have that glaze go right on top of the shadows, right on top of the shadows, so it all will work together harmoniously. Okay, so that's good. Now, uh, with this here, let's go ahead and take a look uh, I think we'll want to just introduce maybe a little bit of this color um, slightly in the background. So I'm going to uh, take just a section of it, actually what's on my brush, and I'm going to mix it into the matte medium so we'll have a more diluted glaze. So whereas that one was maybe about 90 matte medium 10% paint ratio this will be 95.5 so more matte medium in this mix and then we'll go ahead and we'll just apply some hints of that to the background just to kind of reiterate the colors here and promote a little more color harmony that's the beautiful thing with the glazes is if you go really light you can just play around with things and just kind of see how they look you can see okay I like what that did I like the color temperature here and if you don't like it, you can always adjust it. You can adjust it by using a more complementary color the next time. Um, you know, if you remember your color wheel lessons, or maybe you're new to that, but you know, red and green complementary colors, blue and orange, purple and yellow, they're all complementary colors, and you can uh, shift something away quickly by using the complementary color. So if something is too strong, add the complementary glaze on top of it and you'll neutralize it. Just a, just a fun little tip for you. So step number three. Step number three is where we're gonna add some color to the palette, uh, to the hair and to the face. So for that, let's see, I'm gonna switch over to this, uh, this is like a half inch or a five eighths brush and we'll go back to our palette and I'll need to get a little more matte medium on the palette. So squirt that over here to the side. And let's go ahead and pick a color that's gonna work for the palette and the hair. Uh, I think raw sienna will at least be our base. And brush it off to the side, kind of wipe it off of the brush so I can control the mix. And when I dab into the next color, it's not you know, muddying up that color. Uh, we'll take a little bit of burnt sienna. Burnt sienna is just a nice, rich, reddish brown. So as raw sienna is more to the orangish um, temperature, burnt sienna is a little more to the red brownish temperature. But we mix those two colors together and I think that'll get us a nice glaze right off the bat. So we'll go ahead and do that and we're kind of pulling some matte medium into this mix. Um, we'll probably be yeah, about 90% matte medium, 10% paint, maybe 95.5, but just pretty, pretty light. And just to show you this here on our white card, this is what it looks like. You can kind of see it's a nice rich color. But let's go ahead and we'll start applying that right to the top here. We'll start with your hair. And uh, yeah, I like that. So that just kind of um, adds a little bit of richness to it. That we can work in. Let's actually let's just make that a little bit more translucent. I don't I don't want that to be too strong. Where you know you would apply it and then kind of think, oh man, that's really strong. I don't want your painting to. Uh, yeah, I just don't want it to get too opaque right away. So let's just uh, 
add a little more matte medium to this mix. Sometimes you kind of have to test it a little bit. A little more matte medium to the mix. All right, so a little more translucent. And here it is on the white card, so you can see that difference. Now let's go ahead and start this. And yeah, I just want this to be a little bit lighter. Just kind of tone that hair. Just starting that basic idea. And again, we're going right on top of everything. We're looking at the reference photo. So we see the color kind of breaks away right here. We can see the background through the hair. So I do want to make sure I'm not glazing over all that stuff. If I can help it. Letting that background be open in that point. All right, get a little bit of glaze over everything. Um, well, probably a little bit on the strands too. Let's get a little bit there. Yeah, just a little bit in those areas as well. All right, so that's that's good. And now let's go ahead and do the palette. We're going to just refill our brush and we'll start glazing over the palette here. Just start bringing that all the way across. Again, keeping these strokes going across horizontally. Now you notice I had a couple streaky areas. That's all right. You could use a larger brush if you want. You could use that larger uh, flat brush. I forgot to switch out, but that's okay probably easier because you have paint on this brush so if you just um, kind of stick with uh, one section at a time it'll work well and if you keep those let's see so the angle again of the the grain on the, the palette is not parallel with the canvas it's actually tilted so just keep that in mind because I caught myself making it parallel with the canvas but let's let's uh, kind of do it at an angle here so that if we do have some streaks it'll look natural so again, this is our angles that we're trying to create. But I wouldn't try to intentionally create any streaks. I would just try to brush it as smooth as you can. And if you end up with a few streaks, it's not the end of the world. All right, we'll just continue on and smooth this across like that. I'll wipe it away off of her fingers a little bit. I did get it on the other fingers. Now, if it does get on those fingers, don't fret about that either because uh, we're not doing this as a watercolor. We can use the opaque uh, properties of acrylic and we can go over areas that uh, we painted on top and adjust them and fix any mistakes. So no big deal, no big deal at all. Um, but that's, that's good. So we got those colors established here um, lastly, I just want to do some work on her skin tones to kind of set up the initial structure of that. And so for that, I'm going to take my uh, smaller flat brush. That's like a 3 8 flat. And let's go ahead and kind of dip into a little bit of a corner of this matte medium here. I'm studying the color on the reference photo. I'm going to say, let's take um, some pyro orange. That's this more vibrant color here. And a little bit of uh, raw umber dark. And then I think just those two colors for now should be good. So pyro orange and raw umber dark. And I'll show you this uh, on the white card. This is what it looks like right there. I'm going to test that out. Yeah, it's maybe a little too reddish. Let's just um, let's add just a bit of raw sienna to that. Just a little bit of raw sienna just to kind of tone it down a bit. Neutralize a bit of the red of it.
and let's add more matte medium, make this more translucent. So just in this little area, I'm pulling more matte medium into the mix. You want to make sure that this glaze is not too dark. Uh, I'm going to show it to you on the white card. Here it is. And let's uh, actually take a uh, closer look at that. Whoops, just got to get my camera straight here. All right, let's take a look at that. So that's what we're looking at. So something about like that. Something about like that. So now let's go ahead and we'll add this glaze in. Just start to warm up the face a little bit. So this is again going very, very light. Probably seems like it's hardly making a difference, but it is. It's setting up things for future glazes. All right, so we're just kind of doing those darkest shadows for now. And just making some of those differentiations here. Using the chisel edge of the brush. I like to use a thick amount of glaze and then lift away. It does allow it to kind of sit into the groove of the canvas better. So you, you want to make sure you have enough on your brush. Get a little bit of a glaze um, on her hair up here. So it's always good to tie in the hair with the skin tones. And that's a common mistake I see with artists is that they'll paint the hair where it has a very hard edge. Um, and it looks like it's not really growing out of the scalp. On, on the forehead. So you want to make sure that you've got it, um, have these glazes kind of merge into each other a little bit, and that's going to give it a more realistic effect. So in this sense here, I am um, putting a glaze actually between the area of contrast between the hair and the skin tones. And uh, that's it's a great, great way to develop some realism in it. If you do these layers, Early on, it, it, it serves you well as you get to the latter parts of the painting. All right, so again, just kind of setting up the foundation here. I think this glaze could also go right there and there. And I already have some differentiation in the tones because of my sketch underneath. So I'm going to go ahead and actually let more paint out of my brush but this is already starting to kind of set up, so I have to not overdo it. Now let's go ahead and we'll do the um, other section, um, doing kind of the fingers in those areas. We'll put in a glaze um, on the right-hand side of her fingers, on the joint, leaving this area here alone, except we'll put a little glaze right on that edge. Oh, and I realize I rested my hand on that palette, but that's okay, it's still wet. Oh well. Alright, we can add a glaze right here on her fingers and right there and right there. And again, just starting to introduce the skin tones. That's what we're trying to do here. Let's just hop back up to the top quick and we'll add a little glaze right there. Okay, so I do have a shadow right here that would be nice to lock in at this stage, but I'm going to have to let that go because the paint is still wet. Um, so that'll be coming down the line. Yeah, we'll, we'll address that later. But for now, this is where we're at. So uh, this is the end of lesson five. We're kind of moving along here. Uh, keep in mind that things will really be progressing in the painting. Uh, between lessons five and six, and then six and seven, seven and eight. I think at this stage after this lesson, I will start doing some bonus videos to kind of move the painting along a little further in the progress uh, because I want to show you, you know, everything from beginning to end. But keep in mind these bonus videos, there's just way too many hours of them um, to post them on my YouTube channel. They will be in the All Access Membership, the Realistic Acrylic All Access Membership, specifically within this 2023 Spring Acrylic Portrait Painting Challenge Masterclass Premium Level. Uh, it'll be in that particular section of the school. 
and uh, keep in touch because I'll be opening up the doors to the All Access membership very, very soon at the end of this challenge. But for now, I want to continue to show you more. This is where we're at. So this is what we've accomplished today. Uh, you can see things starting to take shape little by little, uh, just kind of light and airy, getting in the different skin tones, getting in some of the color differentiation, getting in some of the contrast, even building up some depth in the portrait little by little. And again, I want to say this is something that you can do. So continue with the process. If you're having any struggles with it, any questions, get a hold of me here in the comments below in our Realistic Acrylic Portraits Facebook group in the critiques. And there's also some folks there that are willing to help as well. So uh, I wanna say thank you though for putting in this effort and I cheer you on. I'm praying for you that you're gonna be able to finish this portrait well and you will be able to paint a portrait you can be proud of that you can give as a gift or you can enter into an art show or just hang up on your wall and be proud of. So anyway, I look forward to teaching you more. Thank you so much. God bless and we'll talk to you soon.